Yesterday, I read an article by uh, by David Hansen, also known as DHH, the creator of, of Ruby on Rails. Uh, and it was entitled, let me let me pull this up here because it was, it was a great title. Get in, losers. We're moving to Linux. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, 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 DHH has has been migrating towards Linux, and uh, he moved over to Framework Laptop, and he's been using Arch, and and he's really been getting into the Linux lately, and he's just getting super excited about it, which is great to see. It's it's really awesome to see people really get excited about Linux uh, for the first time or again. And he wrote this article up, and he had a, a section of it that really caught my eye and it really crystallized something for me that I, I want to talk about a little bit here. And that is this. There is a crazy amount of momentum in Arch Linux and in Hyperland as a window manager. And I think that, that for a lot of people, that's going to be a little bit surprising. Because Arch Linux, as great as it is, I mean, I've made fun of Arch Linux like many of you have for, for years now. Right, the old, the old, old mantra of "By the way, I run Arch," uh, is 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 a has been repeated as a joke for years and years. I mean, we've we've often referred to Arch users as the the vegans of the Linux world, not because Arch is bad, but because they can't stop themselves from telling you that they're running Arch. <laughs> it's just it's entertaining. Um, but he points out, David Hansen, uh, DHH, points out in his article that a lot of really prominent uh, personalities, YouTubers, developers, etc., are moving over to both Arch and Hyperland. I'm just going to read a little bit from uh, from this article here to you now. Quote, I also wouldn't underestimate the cultural influence of a few key people. PewDiePie sharing his journey into Arch and Hyperland with his 110 million followers is important. The primogen moving to Arch and Hyperland is important. Typecraft teaching beginners how to build an Arch and Hyperland setup from scratch is important. And who I just spoke to about uh, Omarki. Omarki? I'm not sure how you pronounce that. Uh, Gabe Newell's Steam Deck being built on Arch and pushing Proton to over 20,000 compatible Linux games is important. You'll notice a trend here, which is that Arch Linux, a notoriously, quote, difficult distribution, is at the center of much of this new engagement, despite the fact that it's been around since 2003. There's nothing new about Arch, but there's something new about the circles of people it's engaging. And he's absolutely right here. Uh, DHH is absolutely correct. The there is a strange amount of momentum behind Arch Linux that was not there a few years ago. A few years ago, we could point to a few Arch derivative distributions that were doing fairly well. And uh, there were a number of, let's say, kind of mid-level YouTubers and, and podcasters that were enjoying Arch Linux. And it was a, it was a, a quality distribution. A great base. The Arch user repository was fantastic, and and many people admired it. But it was it was not a number one thing. It it did not appear to have the momentum. And then the Steam Deck came along, and the Steam OS and the Steam Deck being built on top of Arch was significant, because that's a major AAA game company and, and Steam, the game platform being on top of Arch, really putting their, their blessing and their engineering resources behind things working well on Arch. That's a big deal. And people like the Primogen, which, I, again, you know, the Primogen is, is not going to reach a bazillion people, but it, his reach is not insignificant. And when he, he comes out there and is talking about using Arch and using Hyperland, People take notice. The same thing with PewDiePie. PewDiePie comes out, though, and he talks He talks about Arch and Hyperland to 100 million people. It's crazy. It's wild. Hyperland, man. And, and to put this in context, the developer of Hyperland, a guy named Vaxry, was banned from being involved in the free desktop organization, even though he builds a Wayland-based window manager, so he should be part of the free desktop organization, which is where Wayland lives, but he was banned from it by Red Hat employees. 
right? So we're what we're seeing right and now some of the most influential people to have realistically ever really promoted any one window manager and Linux distribution combo are pushing Arch and Hyperland? I mean, how how anti-corporate can you get? And there's a there's a there's a number of takeaways here. One is that this is moving distinctly away from uh, Red Hat, from IBM, from Canonical, from KDE, from GNOME, from the names that have been sort of synonymous with successful Linux projects entirely, right? Or corporate Linux projects. We're just leaving them behind. And Arch and Hyperland. I mean, it's just one one significant person after another moving that way. It's really it's really noteworthy. It's very very noteworthy. And, and and I'm a I'm a fan of Hyperland. Now I I tend to not use Wayland based uh, compositors and 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 whatnot. But I'm a fan of Hyperland. Hyperland is a is a quality, fun, customizable system. It's all about you know making your system look really sweet and look really nerdy, and uh, and be really really pleasing on the eye, right? And so, but I so I get why a lot of people use it. I, I do. It's a quality system. I think if I were to sit down and build a Wayland based system right now. I would use Hyperland as my window manager. I, I just would. I think, I, I think that it's it's got a lot going for it, and and the and DHH is doing that right now with what is this Omarchy O M A R C H Y dot org calls it uh, an opinionated Arch slash Hyperland setup by DHH, uh, and he's got uh, a bunch of details there where you, how you can set it up uh, uh, all on your own, and I think this is worth noting right now. Because at a time when so many of the major Linux projects are legitimately floundering, certain things are excelling. People are, are gravitating towards uh, projects and uh, options which just haven't gotten the the spotlight until now. Uh, and, and I I want to I want to call something out here because I think this is this is incredibly important. Um, back at the end of June, I, I posted a show where the title was this Linux in 2025, less software, less features, less tested and slower. And I want to call this out a little bit because in that show, I pointed out how many of the major projects that were out there were replacing things that worked with things that didn't work. They were replacing uh, core utilities within Linux systems like LS, sudo, top even, uh, with untested clones rewritten in, in Rust, right? Uh, so we got less features, less tested features, less software in general. Uh, I also pointed out how, you know, people were looking to replace X11 with Wayland. And because of that, we do lose some functionality and we do actually lose some speed in certain ways as well. And some distributions were dropping or looking at dropping 32 bit software support and the like. Now, some of these things are simply not an issue on the Arch side of things. Now, uh, the Arch Hyperland combination means going with Wayland instead of Xorg or, or X11 or Xlibre or what have you. Um, so I don't know that that would be my first number one choice, but I get where people are coming from. They're looking around and they're saying, I want a Linux system that looks like it's really going forward in the future, not one of the ones that appears to be in the process of being murdered by their big tech overlords, right? Because so many of these, these problems that we're seeing coming into the future right now over the next several months and several releases of these major Linux distributions, they tend to be pushed by some major companies. Well, those sorts of things just don't impact Arch and Hyperland. <laughs> it just, they just don't impact it at all. Right. And so I think people are reacting to that. And the other thing I think that they're reacting to is is this. And DHS touched on this and, and, and I want to mention it as well. If you are building a a let's say a Linux laptop or a Linux desktop 
and you decide to go with Arch and Hyperland, you are making a conscious decision to do something that is distinctly different than Windows or Mac. It doesn't look like Windows. It doesn't look like Mac OS at all, right? You, what you're making is something that looks like it's out of a sci-fi movie. It's a Unixy system out of a sci-fi movie and it's distinct and it's nerdy and it's cinematic and it's vibrant and it's customizable to the, to the roof of customizability. Oh my gosh. And it's its own real thing. And what I see is the trend, the momentum is behind systems that allow people to make Linux, Linux, not to make Linux look like and act like a Mac or a Windows machine. There's, there's value in that, sure, but that's not where we're seeing the momentum. Where we're seeing that momentum is in people who are like, you know what? We've done the Windows thing. We've done the Mac thing. We've done the thing where we make Windows desktops or Linux desktops look like Windows desktops. There's so many ways of doing that. And people have been doing that for years. What we're seeing, where we're seeing the real momentum is in letting Linux be friggin' Linux. And I gotta say, that's refreshing. That's refreshing here. Now, me personally, would I have encouraged Vaxry to develop Hyperland on top of X11 instead of Wayland? Yes, I would have. That would have been my personal choice just from a technological point of view. But that doesn't change the whole customizability, letting Linux be Linux sort of thing that I think is drawing a lot of people into Arch and also into Hyperland. It's fascinating. I'm going to be very curious to see in the months and quarters ahead what that really does in terms of market share. It's going to be very interesting to watch that. It's, it's very difficult to measure that. You know, it's almost easier to measure the feeling within Linux market share than the actual numbers. Like you can, you can stick your, you know, lick your finger and put it in the air and see where the wind is blowing. You can see what people are running when you go to conferences. You can, you know, see what people are screenshotting and what they're excited about, but getting those actual numbers in Linux desktops is incredibly, incredibly difficult. I, I do it regularly where I try and analyze it as best we can, but even with all everything I know about how all of the individual distributions, uh, uh, track uh, server usage and, and downloads and everything else, it's still very, very difficult. But uh, just the same, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my best to try and take a snapshot of it over the coming months and really try and figure that out. Because I, I would love to see how this momentum truly reflects in overall numbers of users going forward. It, it's going to be very interesting. Um, uh, but you can get that article over at... Uh, Oh, gosh, where does DHS publish this? World.hey.com slash DHH. <laughs> so that's where you can grab grab his uh, uh, grab his blog post from uh, David Hansen there called Get In Losers, We're Moving to Linux, which is pretty good. Um, uh, let's see here. Uh, and also his O-Marky, O-M-A-R-C-H-Y dot org, his opinionated Arch and Hyperland setup. Uh, thank you to the Lunduke Journal subscribers for allowing me to cover all of these incredibly nerdy topics for the last several years and well into the future. Go to lunduke.com and subscribe. Uh, this is really the last bastion of, of completely big tech free, truly independent tech journalism. Uh, you're not going to get this anywhere else. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, Boys and girls, nerds and nerdettes, across this glorious intertube of ours, I do declare, end broadcast.